erected in 1910 is the statue of the 8th Duke of Devonshire, Spencer Compton. He was a mayor of Eastbourne. On the 13th of May, 1874, Eastbourne announced local resident William Earp was proposing to build a magnificent hotel with a 400-foot frontage at a cost of £50,000. The result was the Grand Hotel, which is the large white building set back on your right. This is the only five-star seafront hotel in the country. When the Grand Hotel opened in 1877, there was only six bathrooms to serve 200 rooms. Chambermates had to carry hot water to the bathrooms twice a day. Many famous people have stayed here. Eastbourne's had one of the very first municipal bus services in 1903. The earliest buses had an open driver's cab with no number plate. They were painted in red and brown livery. We'll soon be able to see the white cliffs rising to almost 600 feet coming into view on the left. The cliffs known as Beachy Head is said to be derived from the old French Beauchef, meaning beautiful headland. These are the highest chalk sea cliffs in Britain, and they are the most easterly part of the South Downs. Below, on your left, are the Hollywell Gardens, a wonderful sun trap with rockeries and a tea chalet. Before this, it was a huge chalk quarry. The council converted the quarry into the beautiful gardens in the winter of 1904, after a discovery that the excavation was polluting a nearby water spring. Also perched on the cliff top is Helen Gardens, an 18 hole putting course and lawn box overlooking the sea. This is the stop at the Hollywell Gardens. on your right was the All Saints Convalescent Hospital, built in 1869. Originally an Anglo-Catholic nunnery. Due to the climate along the south coast being considered good, many hospitals and nursing homes were built in Eastbourne. Since closing of the hospital in 2004, the chapel is used for wedding and dinner venues. On your left are the Italian gardens. These are unusual secluded lawns with a seated wooded amphitheatre carved out in the cliff face. Next is St. Bede's School, founded in 1895 by Mrs. Francis Brown. During the war, it was evacuated and the building was used to train over 2,000 code breakers. Coming up is the stop for the foot of Beachy Head, Foyles Way and the kiosk. You can walk from here to Beachy Head, but be warned, it is a very steep hill. For the top of Beachy Head, please stay on the bus.
In the Middle Ages, Eastbourne prospered as a sheep farming and fishing area. The settlement was sold in 1555 to three Sussex families, the Hildes, the Burtons and the Southwinds, whose legacy can be seen throughout the town today by way of street names and pictures. An essay by Dr Richard Russell in 1752 extolled the medicinal benefits of the seaside. His views were a great advantage to the south coast and the east war became known as the Empress of Watering Places. By the mid-19th century, most of the area was owned by just two families. The Cavendish family owned most of the seafront and the Gilberts were slightly inland. We now start to climb the chalk downs towards the cliffs of Beachy Head. These face southwards and are therefore subject to severe southwesterly gales, which cause erosion of the cliff faces and help maintain their whiteness. The coast is receiving up to three feet a year, and sometimes there is an even larger form, such as in 2002, when a large piece fell away into the sea. And parts of this are still visible today. Beachy Head Cliffs have been eroding for at least 10,000 years, ever since the end of the last ice age. The chalk of Beachy Head and the surrounding area is made up of millions of tiny animal shells called coccoliths, which can only be seen under a microscope, so small you can fit around 1,000 of them on a pinhead. You can also see thin black bands in the chalk. These are formed by a chemical process which dissolves the silica fragments. When sea creatures such as sponges die, they leave behind tiny silica fragments which ingrain themselves into the chalk and form flint modules. Flint is one of the most useful rocks man has ever found. It's an extremely hard mineral and when struck, breaks with a shell-shaped fracture with razor-sharp edges which can easily cut meat.
many of these survive intact now. In 2014, skeletal remains of a woman who lived around 425 AD were discovered in the vicinity of Beachy Head Dunland Estate. These remains were to be of a 30-year-old woman, genetic heritage from sub-Saharan Africa. Her ancestors came over at a time when the Roman Empire extended as far as North Africa. Two monarchs visited the quiet fishing community in the Middle Ages. Henry I and Edward II both stayed at a manor house which stood near the centre of the modern day town, off from the area known as the Dock. The 18th and 19th centuries would see Eastbourne change from a small village into a bustling town. This all changed when the Prince Regent made neighbouring Brighton into a popular health resort and built a flamboyant royal pavilion. Populations doubled every 10 years in the early part of the past century, with the arrival of the railway in 1849, and twice the town's activity. The population swelled from a little over 3,000 in 1851 to over 22,000 in 1881 to now over 100,000 today. Electricity was soon to come to Eastbourne.